the term indigenous peoples acquired a life of its own. And that, began, that process began in the 1960s, for example, and that is precisely when you have the first attempts by, by the legislature to, to address the issues of indigenous people's rights, which is the Manahan Amendments, 1960, which was preceded by a parang nationwide uh, research project by a certain, pa a certain panel or committee by the uh, Philippine Congress at that time. Interview sila, no? Uh, so it was, it was indicative of a period in time which coincided with the lagging boom where, and, and the mining boom, <laughs> for the Cordilleras, where people were beginning to feel the impact of encroachments from the outside on the inside. Until that time, there was re relative peace, no? Tignan mo yung uh, the Moros, for example, the Moro peoples. Until the 50, 50s and 60s, you have uh, communities living together in peace. But by the 60s and 70s, when the when, ito, when the demograph there, there was a demographic demographic shift within the local communities, and you have the encroachment of capital, you have logging concessions coming in, ranchers coming in. That's when. Uh, uh, conflict came out, and that's when the label of indigenous peoples came to be appropriated. Now, amin itong lupa dahil kayo na naman, kayo na rin ang sabi, katutubo kami. Dito kami tumubo. No? So, um, that developed, no, this, this push by the indigenous peoples to assert their own rights using what is ultimately an, a colonial, uh, uh, a concept of colonial origin, uh, developed until the point where um, specific calls or demands develop. No? On one hand, there is the, the call for recognition of land rights or resource rights. And on the other, you have the call for autonomy or self-determination. Um, it is looking in hindsight as a advocate of indigenous rights, I may have simplified the situation. No? Because I have, as somebody coming from the more, uh, what do you call that, progressive elements of the movement, I had assumed, actually, that all indigenous peoples were looking for self-determination, were headed for the f definition of self-determination. When it turns out, looking back, that, oh, yes, no? There are indigenous groups who are uh, advocating or searching for answers to a much more limited issue, which is land, no? Uh, I remember the very, very, very first case I handled in Mindoro, mga mangyan. When I asked them, what, what are your demands? No? And they were, all they would say is, i-release ang lupa. No? Give us land. So wala, th there is no notion that they already own the land. They were asking us to, give, to, uh, to, to uh, persuade the government to issue land to the mangyans. And it's a, as I said, it's a very limited agenda. No? Walang, there was no, no sense of where they would take this ownership. No? It was limited to tenurial security. So let us, let us be more sensitive about this distinction, that there are indigenous groups who are interested in self-determination in a broad sense. No? And there are also groups who are quite content to, to merely receive titles or certificates of ancestral domains or ancestral land certificates. No? Uh, uh, to their land, and as far as they are concerned, they are happy if, if, we, if they receive that. You know? uh, be that as it may, uh, in the international arena, this notion of indigenous peoples, indigenous rights soon developed so that uh, in conjunction with local advocacy, local activism, you ultimately had a political necessity on the part of the Philippine state to respond to these political demands again, to ancestral domain and to self-determination. And their response legislatively has been IPRA. No. Um, I won't rehearse the points already raised by the two previous speakers, so let me proceed with my own critique of the IPRA. Um, the interesting thing for me when I look at the IPRA is the, is the difficulty it represents in terms of reconciling it with my own notion of the modern nation state. The modern nation state is premised on the idea of territorialization. No? It wants to convert as much as it can into its territories. It wants to convert as many communities as possible into its subjects or its citizens. No? Uh, you can call it political incorporation, but the current term is, uh, well, 
one of the current terms is territorialization. It seeks to incorporate groups, territories, resources into its political order. Um, we can see that particularly in frontier areas where state presence is bet somewhere between nil and negligible. No? So uh, what? State presence is represented by DNR, for example. No? Babantay, sino yung nag illegal cutting? Or Sundalo, the military, because they want to check uh, whether these indigenous peoples, for example, are trying to come up with uh, links or bonds with groups labeled as subversive. No? But that is not specific to frontier situations. Even in states, for example, like uh, Indonesia, no? territorialization is an ongoing process. No? Uh, groups like uh, people in Aceh, for example, or Western Papua New Guinea, uh, Western Papua, would assert self-determination in a sense, no? or self-governance. And uh, Indonesia reacts negatively. No? Asserting that, no, you, they, these people are part of the Indonesian state. So the process of territorialization is not a one-time thing. It is a constant struggle on the part of the, the state. Now, how do we reconcile this, this drive with the IPRA? Because in IPRA, the state is giving away, in a sense, no? in a very concrete sense, giving away titles to land, giving away titles to resources. Uh, how do we reconcile this with the drive to... Um, how do we reconcile this to the drive to uh, territorialize, to, to capture as, many type, as much territory as possible? And we can do this, I think, by looking at the one thing that the state, powerful as it is, dominant as it is within the current political landscape, no? uh, that ha has to bow to, and that is capital. Again, we go back to the point of Dean Rovillos, no? neoliberalism. So, um, in a sense, IPRA was a triumph as much of activism on the part of indigenous peoples, on the part of activists, as of neoliberalism. No? Uh, it, it's, it's only recently that I realized this is because, uh, and uh, this is because I was, what do you call this, canalized, channeled by my own experience. It's only when we come out and realize, oh yes, that, that, that alongside all of these struggles, all of these deaths, all of these sacrifices, there was also a cold bureaucratic uh, process whereby the idea of privatization of assets was inculcated into the system. And you can see that clearly in the history of DENR regulations. How do they deal with uh, groups of people? No? And you can see, first they start with social forestry. This, uh, and then ultimately, if you, you, can, you can trace this in a linear fashion, it ends up with the IPRA. No? So what this evolution tells us is the emergence of a new legal and political actor, and that is the community. And you can see, again, the struggle of the Philippine legal system to, to deal with this novelty. First, it was a cooperative. No, it doesn't work. No, DNR experimented with that. Uh, next, it was a uh, non-stock, non-profit corporations, and sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Until ultimately, when we come to the IPRA itself, we come to the notion of the community as an entity in itself, and that is radical, and that is new. Huh? So, IPRA is a compromise between an economic framework, a dominant economic framework, and an indigenous legal framework seeking, seeking security over land and resources. Now, uh, there's no gain saying the benefits that people or communities have gained through the IPRA. Uh, I would like to point out, however, certain aspects that have been, that tended to be neglected when we talk about IPRA and its impact. First, simplification. No? IPRA simplifies. Whereas previously, a corporation coming into the Philippines has to negotiate with every clan because each clan has its own idea of where their territory, territory is. Now it's easier. Why? Because it's prepackaged for you. No? The boundaries are there. The owners are there. All you need to do is talk to the, the person whose name appears on the title. So it, it simplifies what is a very complex uh, tenurial uh, landscape no? into a 
basically a, tel a, tel a torrent system where you have blocks labeled by specific names. And secondly, it, it simplifies by uniformizing tenure. You have from the Bajau to the Itnag, from the Manobo to the uh, Agta, there is only one system of law now. There, diba? Local cultures are irrelevant. All you have to do when you want to talk about tenure, resource control, ownership, is look at the IPRA. You don't need to consult the elders because the uniform processes are provided in the IPRA. Second, IPRA bureaucratizes. On one hand, the procedures become more complex. No? Um, once upon a time, if a manobo wanted to make a living, he went out, he, 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 he cut his kaingin. Now he has to check with his, what? Uh, is it compatible with his uh, ancestral domain management plan? With the rules and regulations implementing the ancestral domain management plan? If the, if the territory is within a protected area, then you have an even more complicated system. No? So the procedures for enjoying land and resources has become more complex. Secondly, as was pointed out by Dean Rovillos, no, it institutionalizes state intervention. Now, the state becomes the ultimate arbiter of what is right, what is wrong, who has what rights to which areas. Third, surveillance. Now that everything is, in, is written down, the state can track who has what transactions with whom. Okay. Lastly, IPRA commodifies ancestral domains. Now, some of you might point out, no, sales of land are prohibited. But sales are irrelevant, no? Dole Corporation, for example, has done quite well, even without having to buy out all of those farmers in southern Cotabato, diba? What do they do? Contract farming. Hmm? So, sales of land is immaterial, no? It's not, it's not necessary for capitalism to, 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 to have titled lands, to have to ownership of lands. Now you need only contract farming. What is, well, some advocates would say, well, at least that the people I work with are not going to sell the land. Well, that, at least that's the hope. No? But in a sense, that is irrelevant. The point is that that piece of land to which they have title to has become part of an, a larger economic system within which their piece of land is viewed as an asset, is viewed as a commodity which, with which they can transact. No? So in a sense, uh, looking beyond the community's boundaries, we have a sense that uh, people are becoming more, more and more vulnerable to the neoliberal uh, system or economic or market system. So by way of a looking back as my, in terms of my experience as community worker then, we realized that working merely for tenurial security, working or organizing merely to ensure that one group or this group uh, has title is an inadequate response. Why? Because you locate the territory within the market economy, but you ignore that community's capacity to deal with the market economy. FPIC, for example, free and, free, uh, not free and prior informed consent. Uh, in theory, they can say yes or no, but you look at the community, they are starving. No? So, the first multinational corporation that comes with a very tempting deal, uh, there's going to be a very strong temptation to grab it. No? Uh, so it has to go beyond merely tenure. Uh, it has to go beyond merely ownership of land or resources. But as I said, no, fortunately or for, unfortunately, some people are content with this idea that title is enough. Title is a victory. Uh, so it's a question of here, differing parameters, differing political uh, levels of political analysis.